from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, everyone. I'm Tracy Grant, the editor of Kids Post at the Washington Post. Post has been a proud sponsor of the National Book Festival for all of its 11 years. Um, before we meet our next author, I'd like to do a little audience participation. Raise your hand if you're 12 years old. Okay. Raise your hand if you're going to be 12 years old anytime in the next two years. Okay. Raise your hand if you've ever been 12 years old. Okay. Now raise your hand if you've ever written a book. Ooh. Okay, we're gonna switch gears for a second here. Raise your hand if you have a dog. Okay. Raise your hand if you like dogs. Now raise your hand if you've ever read a book where the dog dies. Think Old Yeller, My Dog Skip, and of course the twofer, Where the Red Fern Grows. Now here are my two favorite cool facts about today's author, Gordon Corman. He wrote his first book when he was 12 years old. And he hates books in which the dog dies. <clears throat> in fact, his No More Dead Dogs has a spot of honor on my now 15-year-old son's bookshelf. There's probably lots more you want to know about Gordon Corman, including how he researched his new trilogy about kids aboard the Titanic. And I'm sure he'll be happy to answer all of your questions. So here he is, child prodigy, animal lover, and great author, Gordon Corman. Well, thank you so very much. Thank you for coming. I mean, this is my first National Book Festival. It, it's awesome so far. Um, I, I should also mention the thing about writing a book when I was 12, that was a very long time ago because I could just see in a lot of people's faces, dude, you look terrible. Um, <laughs> but that was actually, my, my first book was published in 1978, so it's um, 33 years ago. And I've been involved in a ton of different stuff. Um, the 39 Clues, which is um, one of the main sort of focuses of today, has been one of the coolest projects. You, you know, the best thing about being a 39 Clues writer is you get to go to things like this and and say sentences like, are you ready to save the world? And um, you know, the hunt is on. And um, it, it's been a real blast, um, especially since in, in the first series, uh, the great Rick Riordan wrote uh, book one and, and did an amazing job with it. Um, but it was a little bit hard coming in later because um, you know, you're a control freak when you're a writer and you want to do it your way. I mean, even something as simple as how do your characters say hello to each other, right? Do they say hi? Do they say, yo? Do they say, what's up? Do they say, how you doing? How are you? Um, I, I went to high school with a kid for four years. He never once used the word hello. He always used to say, greetings. <laughs> and exactly like that, you know, the phone would ring, hello, brief pause, greetings. Um, but you know, You've never met my friend, but don't you have a feeling in the back of your mind for just the kind of doofus we're talking about because of one word? Well, if you can get that much personality out of a word, think how much you can get out of dialogue. But here's the thing. When I was writing One False Note, I was writing Amy and Dan Cahill's dialogue. They had been talking for an entire book before my book started. And that's why when the Cahills versus Vespers series came, started and they gave me the chance to write book one, I sort of felt like, yeah, this is the time to like really be the kickoff guy. Um, and, and they've really just amped up that, that kind of level of tension, right? We all know that the Cahills are the most powerful family in human history, uh, but that doesn't mean they're without rivals, okay? For 500 years, there has been a group lurking in the shadows, the Vespers, 
uh, waiting for their chance to stomp across the world stage. In the same instant, in seven different time zones around the world, seven Cahill cousins are kidnapped. And now Amy and Dan Cahill are given ransom demands um, to produce and, and uh, steal and hand over these priceless, valuable artifacts from museums around, all around the world. The Medusa plot focuses on um, the, uh, the painting actually on a wooden shield called Caravaggio's Medusa. It, it's on page 66 of the book, but I really recommend Google images or something. You've got to see this thing in color. It is the most disturbing, malevolent, hideous image I've ever seen. And because it's on a shield, so it's, it's concave, it's kind of coming out at you, you, you know, with, with evil intent. Um, <clears throat> and so I'm looking at this, and obviously a really, really cool, very 39 clues worthy kind of image. But I also sort of thought, the Vespers are not art collectors. What do they really want this painting for? And then I looked at the snake hair. And I thought, well, what if those snakes were more than just snakes? What if they were a treasure map of the tunnels underneath the Roman Colosseum? And that's what the Vespers are really after. The, um, the amazing response to Cahill's versus Vespers has been so gratifying. It's like we've turned our fans into conspiracy theorists. Now, they, they think that there's a Vesper behind every door. I got an email the other day from a kid who said, I think my mother is a Vesper. <laughs> I think that's the kind of thing you only get from a kid because an adult would probably say, I think my mother-in-law is, is, is a Vesper. Um, but there are famous Vespers in history. My, my, my personal favorite, George S. Patton, right, was, was a Vesper. Uh, and the Allied invasion, Operation Torch of North Africa, turning point of World War II, uh, was not actually planned. It was a cover operation because the Vespers were moving on a Cahill artifact in the city of Casablanca. So you're always sort of looking in 39 Clues to make that connection between real history and the pure fiction of the story. Um, I, my first book that I did in the series is, is One False Note, and it focused on uh, Mozart. Now, do I look like a Mozart fan to you? And, well, even if I do, I'm, I was in high school in the 70s. Um, you know, I could tell you a lot about the Ramones, but I know absolutely nothing about Mozart. So I start researching Mozart, and it, one of the most fun things about 39 Clues is the research we do. My favorite Mozart fact, he died broke, okay? And in those days, if you didn't have enough money left over to pay for your own funeral, they buried you in what was called a pauper's grave, which basically means they take your body and they chuck it in this gigantic pit with like 50 other dead people, right? And then they plow it over, they, they fill it in. There is no grave marker, there is no record. Mozart is just gone, like nobody knows what happened to the greatest composer of all time. So I thought to myself, okay, why was Mozart broke in the first place? Like, he was famous when he was still alive. The guy had money. What was he blowing it on? And that became my what if for one false note, which is what if, you know, 200 and something years ago, Mozart got mixed up in the search for the 39 clues, right? But going on for centuries, and he became obsessed, and he started sinking all his money and all his time and his resources into that. So for book eight, for example, um, one of the famous Cahills that came into the Emperor's Code was uh, George Mallory, who's a very famous climber who was killed on Mount Everest. They found his body in the year 2000. You know when he went missing? 1924. And he's still up there because he got killed so high up that he froze almost immediately. And in, in, at that altitude, it never gets warm enough for him to kind of unfreeze. You kind of look at me like, dude, you picked the grisliest thing you could think of and wrote a book series about it? Frozen dead people on the side of a mountain? But you know, there's something about Mallory that's very 39 clues friendly, okay? His body is three quarters of the way up the mountain, but we don't know something important. 
when he got killed, was he on the way up or was he coming back down again? Most people don't believe Mount Everest was climbed till 1953. Mallory was on the mountain nearly 30 years before that. What if he made it and he was on the descent when something went wrong and, and he lost his life? So that's the what if of the emperor's coat. Mallory was a Cahill. He was climbing Mount Everest, not because it's there, but because he needed to hide one of the 39 clues on the summit. Right? He succeeded, planted the bottle on the pinnacle. He was descending, something went wrong, and he got killed. But the clue is still on the summit of Mount Everest. Um, so now Amy and Dan Cahill have to get it. Now, a helicopter normally cannot go to the summit of Mount Everest. Have you ever heard this? The air gets thinner the higher up you go. At a certain point, it's so thin that the rotor blade has nothing to push off of, right? There's no lift to the air. Um, that happens at like 20,000 feet. Mount Everest is nearly two miles higher than that. But in the year 2005, these French scientists created a super ultralight chopper called the A-Star, okay? Did, if you ever see a picture of it, it almost doesn't look like a helicopter. It looks kind of like a really big hamster cage with a, a, a rotor blade on top. But it's so light that it needs almost zero lift. And in 2005, two pilots took this thing to the summit of Everest. So now Amy and Dan Cahill have to find the super secret hangar where the A-Star is being kept and literally catch a ride to the, to the top of the world to get their clue. Um, I did a lot of my research for uh, The Emperor's Code because I'd already written an adventure series uh, called Everest about, about a kind of an expedition to become the youngest climber in history on, on top of Everest. And I think that that's what Research is sort of the gift that keeps on go giving. You know, like the more you know about stuff, it just finds its way into a lot of places I in your work. Um, when I was writing Everest, the key piece of research was for every four climbers who make it to the summit, on average, one climber dies trying. And, and that told me, okay, if I've got four teenagers on my team trying to become the youngest climber in history to conquer the world's highest mountain, well, there's a decent chance maybe one of those four might not be coming home again. And so the research almost writes the story for you, or at least the facts dictate the fiction. You know, um, my newest series is Titanic, right? Kids in 1912 on the ill-fated maiden voyage. Um, big research topic. So kind of the, the big numbers are when the Titanic sank, there were 2,223 passengers and crew aboard. You know how many people got rescued? 706. So more than two-thirds of the people on the Titanic died that night. What does that tell me? Well, um, you can't write a story with 2,000 main characters. So what you do is you choose a bunch and you follow them through the sinking. Now, I like happy endings, so I was kind of tempted to have all of my characters survive at the end. And then I thought to myself, is that reasonable? Not really. I mean, it's possible, kind of, but in a disaster where two-thirds of the people lost their lives, surely at least a couple of mine aren't going to make it. And, and you know what? If I'm really so married to the idea of a happy ending, why did I choose the Titanic as my topic <laughs> in the first place, right? Now, I, I, when I was writing that one, I just kept thinking about the phrase, we're all in the same boat, because um, Titanic was so big that when it sank, it was almost six different boats, right? Depending on where you were and what your class was, uh, you had a totally different experience. We all know the classic Titanic story. It sank head first, so a lot of people went to the very stern. And because the ship turned up vertically before it sank, all these people were at the very, very back were able to climb up over the railing and, and literally stand on the stern of the Titanic and ride it down, L like an elevator. Really, there, there were real electric elevators on the, the Titanic. Um, 
In the movie, they made a very big deal about getting sucked down with the weight of the ship, but there were a lot of eyewitness accounts that said the opposite. There, there was one man who said he rode it down like an elevator, stepped off at the perfect time, and didn't even get his hair wet. Right? Now, if you were further forward, your sinking experience was completely different. First of all, you were in the water several minutes before that. Uh, there was a whole bunch at the base of the first smokestack. And um, what happened with them was the bow was getting lower and lower and lower. And eventually, the ocean just sort of filled in where the boat used to be. And this wave washed them off the deck. Now, at the base of the smokestack, there's this gigantic air intake valve. And the water started pouring into the ship through there. All these people were sucked in by the water pouring into the ship and plastered up against that grating. Every single one of those people was about to drown. You know what happened? At that very moment, somewhere deep inside the ship, uh, one of the furnaces exploded and it created this huge blast of hot air that shot up through the ship, blasted these guys off the grating, shot them all the way up to the surface, and a bunch of them made it onto lifeboats and, and survived. That's, gonna, that's the kind of thing that can only come from research. I mean, I see a lot of really creative people out there. I'm sure you have an amazing imagination. I have a pretty good imagination. You're not gonna make that up. It's not gonna come up in your alphabet soup one day and give you the idea, right? That is gonna come from a book, a museum, the Discovery Channel, whatever. Um, and that's why we're, we're such uh, huge kind of researchers in, in the 39 Clues and adventure writing world. I mean, for me, starting as a kid was just an incredibly lucky break. My first book was my seventh grade English project. Um, true story, in my middle school, get this, the track and field coach had to teach English because they ran out of English teachers and they had extra track and field coaches. We got him, nice guy, good teacher, but at the time he had never taught, you know, English, language arts in his life. And when it came to writing, he just sort of didn't know what to tell us to do, and he drew a blank. He stood there saying, okay, uh, work on whatever you want for the rest of the year. <laughs> it was February, right? So from February to June, we had a class period every single day to write one story, and I got into it. I started taking it home, working on it at night, and, um, I wrote my first book, which was called This Can't Be Happening at McDonald Hall. You know what grade I got on it? B plus. <laughs> How lame is that? Um, they gave me A plus on the story, but they deducted one grade for messiness. Uh, but I I'm happy to report that that book has just been republished by Scholastic, right? So, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> So I'm gonna be 48 next month and I'm still uh, running around hawking my seventh grade English project. It's <laughs> sort of pathetic in a way, but, it, but actually really, really cool. And over the years, that book has been in, you know, French, Swedish, Danish, Norwegian, Chinese, Japanese, Portuguese, Italian, Korean, Dutch, and Greek. Which is kind of wild, you know, to see your seventh grade English project in, in Korean or, or, or Greek or something. I, I love looking at my books in other languages. Um, McDonald Hall is um, a school, and, and the principal, right, the headmaster, is a man named Mr. Sturgeon, and his nickname, behind his back, they call him the fish. In French, he becomes Monsieur Sturgeon, and his nickname becomes Caviar, uh, which is... <laughs> Not really a translation, um, but it, it, some things won't translate at all. Like I wrote a book for younger kids called Liar, Liar, Pants on Fire. And when Liar, Liar, Pants on Fire was done in French, the book translated fine, but the title didn't. Because right? Liar, Liar, Pants on Fire is an expression and you really can't 
translate something like that. So when Liar Liar Pants on Fire was done in French, my translator called me up and said, we tried to translate the title. It actually came out, Teller of Untruths, Your Trousers Have Combusted. <laughs> and um, I think I... I think I thought she was lying, except that I knew this guy who worked for Pepsi. And, and he was like, oh, that's nothing. Remember there used to be this old Pepsi ad where the slogan was, come alive with the Pepsi generation? Supposedly, when they translated that into Chinese, it actually turned out to say, Pepsi brings your ancestors back from the grave. <laughs> so I don't feel so bad about my, my liar liar. But, um, if you know um, 39 Clues, there is a, a character named Jonah Wizard. And um, in, in book eight takes place in China. So, so Jonah's kind of like a 15-year-old hip-hop mogul. And his big slogan was, live large with the Wiz generation. And they had to translate it for the Chinese tour. And it actually turned out to mean, Jonah Wizard makes your ancestors fat. Um, <laughs> but you know, you can sort of see how you can't expect an expression to have the same meaning in another language that, that it has in yours. Even Liar Liar Pants on Fire, for French, they had to change the title. They call the book uh, Super Monteuse, which really just means kind of super liar. Um, it's, it's not as good a title. It's, the book is a little bit autobiographical in that as a kid, I was kind of the world's greatest maker of excuses, right? Writers tend to be that. Um, but I don't write that autobiographically very much. Um, you know, I, I think that authors are observers. Uh, in, in the introduction, they mentioned No More Dead Dogs. And um, I think the idea for No More Dead Dogs was just, um, I'm a huge fan of the TV show Seinfeld. And you know how when he does his little comedy routines, they're really just observations. And a lot of them start off with, did you ever notice that? I visit a lot of schools and I always say to kids, if you want to be a writer, just put yourself in the place of Seinfeld and ask yourself, what are the did you ever notices of my life? And in No More Dead Dogs, it was, did you ever notice in school, whenever your class does a novel study about a classic award-winning book about a dog, the dog always dies at the end, right? Next time you're in the library, find a book with an award sticker and a dog on the cover. Trust me, that dog is going down. Right? <laughs> um, but you know, one, one of the greatest things about doing 39 Clues as well was working with Rick Riordan, because Rick Riordan doesn't, doesn't write from personal experience that much either, but you know what he has? He has the ultimate radar for what's cool, right? An amazing thing for a writer to have, because you can't look into people's minds and realize what they think is cool. So what you do is you go by what you like and hope others do too. Example, I love old movies. And, and my favorite kind of old movies are just these good old fashioned robberies you know, like bank jobs and jewel heists and really elaborate, complicated robberies. I wanted to write about it. Um, you can't really write a book about a bunch of kids who rob a bank and go to jail for 20 years. So I, I, I realized I had to fiddle with the details a little bit. I thought, okay, what if they're not stealing something, they're stealing it back, right? Like they're stealing back something that is rightfully theirs to begin with. And um, I got the idea for a book called Swindle. Right? A kid finds a 1920 Babe Ruth baseball card. He takes it to a collector to figure out what it's worth. Uh, the guy just lies, he tells him it's worthless, buys it cheap. Turns out this card is worth $974,000. Right? It's the second most valuable sports collectible of all time. It, it's gonna sell at an auction for like a, a million dollars. Um, the only way to get it back is to steal it back. So I thought back to what was so awesome about those, those old movies. And it wasn't so much the operation as, as the team, right? And in Swindle, 
they put together a team of kids to steal back the baseball card based on their talents. One girl is a climber. Well, if you can climb a mountain, you can climb a house. So her job is to get them on the roof, let them in the skylight. The electronics whiz deactivates the alarm. One girl is, is really, really good with animals. So she becomes almost like the dog whisperer. You know, like her job is to keep the Doberman from ripping their heads off while they're doing all this. The skinny kid is in charge of crawling through tight spaces. The blowtorch operator, um, he's got the most important job of all. It's very hard to crack a safe, but it's not that hard to just burn a big hole in the side of it, reach in, and take out a million dollar baseball card. So here's this story that in a lot of ways, I never even should have written. I mean, my connection to it is, is kind of flimsy. It's not a true story. I don't really know kids like that. But what was my connection? I loved it. And I loved the old movies that sort of inspired it. There, there are now three swindle books. And they're, if you really look at them, they're just kind of regurgitated movie plots, right? Swindle's a robbery. Zoo break is a prison break. Only instead of breaking people out of jail, they're breaking mistreated animals out of this really cheesy zoo. And then Framed is the newest, which is just sort of a, a classic wrong man sort, sort of story. Whenever you have a chance in school to pick your own topic for writing, always pick something you like, because you're gonna do a better job if you're just writing what you're psyched about. Last thing you wanna be when you're writing is bored, right? If you're bored writing, you write boring. And in that way, you're almost a part of your own audience. If you can't even entertain yourself, how are you gonna entertain total strangers? And you know, I, I am one of those authors who, who does do a lot of school visits. I love meeting my readers. And I think that's because I got started writing w when I was in school. and. Um, and so spending a lot of time in school just always seems to sort of complete the circle for me. You know, it, I, I realized how fluky it was. Um, I actually only sent my book to a publisher because my seventh grade English teacher suggested that we laminate it and put it in the library. Teachers are compulsive laminators, right? So um, <laughs> my, my wife is a teacher, so when, whenever I... Um, speak at schools like colleges and the undergrads say, well, how do I know if teaching is the right career for me? I just sort of say, oh, ask yourself one simple question. Do I feel the need to laminate everything that, <laughs> you know? But I mean, it's such a school kind of career, right? You know how I ended up with Scholastic? Uh, at the time, I was the class monitor for Scholastic book orders, right? So I'm thinking I'm practically an employee of these guys already, right? Keeper of the bonus points. That's like not a small responsibility. So I mailed it to the address on the book order sheets. You're like, that works? <laughs> and, um, and, and I sent it in. So it's just been such a lovely ride for me doing what I'm doing. It's not that great when you're at your high school reunion and everyone's talking about how much they've changed and how much they've grown, how they've sort of reinvented themselves. And then they say to me something like, dude, Last time I saw you, you just published a book with Scholastic. What are you doing now, man? And I say, well, uh, I just uh, published a, a book with Scholastic. <laughs> and they sort of look at me with something approaching pity in their eyes. But you know, I saw this interview of, of, um, with Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones, right? It was from the early, early 60s, okay? The guy was in his early 20s, and Mick Jagger said, no way will I still be singing I Can't Get No Satisfaction <laughs> when I'm 40. Right? Do you know how old he is now? I think he's 69, right? He's a, a senior citizen. He's Sir Mick Jagger, right? He's been knighted by the Queen. Guess what? The Rolling Stones still go on tour every few years, and he still sings I Can't Get No Satisfaction. 
Uh, so I just sort of think of myself as like the Mick Jagger of kids' books. Right? <laughs> that sort of fits. I hope that Mick can get some satisfaction out of what he does for a living by now. Writing for kids has been an immense source of, of, of satisfaction for me. So I would like to thank you so much for coming today. And thank you <laughs> to the National Book Festival. Um, to the National Book Festival and the Library of Congress for just being such an incredible delivery system to connect authors and their readers. Now, we do have some time for questions, if there is anything that I did not talk about or that you would like to ask. Go ahead. Um, I know that probably that no one else will ever ask, has, will probably not ask as many questions about this book, but I read your Son of the Mob uh -huh. book, and I loved it. So I wanted to know where you got your idea for having a kid whose parents are in the mob. Okay, so, well, Son of the Mob is, um, it, it's almost like, it, it's a high school kid whose dad is in the mob who falls for um, the daughter of the FBI agent who's an investigator. It's almost like Romeo and Juliet in the mafia, right? Um, <laughs> It's not from my life, okay? My father is not a retired gangster. I, I do not have mob-connected friends. Uh, it actually came as the result of a brainstorming session um, where my editor, we were talking about some gangster movie, and my editor just said, wouldn't that be a cool idea for a young adult series? And I was like, kids' books about organized crime? <laughs> no, slam. But because It'll never work. I sort of started thinking, how might it work? And within 30 seconds of, of hanging up the phone, it just sort of popped into my head, right? Mob, prince, dates, FBI, princess. OK? Uh, -huh. uh In your book, School, did you base the character uh, Cap um, from someone in your school time? Uh, good question. The question is about Schooled and the character of Capricorn Anderson. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I didn't know, um, I am not a hippie, uh, I certainly do not have the hair to be a hippie, and, um, and I'm actually, believe it or not, too young, like I was six when the 60s ended, um, so my original idea for schooled was homeschooled kids, because I do a lot of presentations where homeschoolers come, and um, great kids, but sometimes not the greatest kids in crowds, you know, and, um, and the what if sort of became what if this homeschooler suddenly got dropped into this massive, you know, kind of dog-eat-dog -dog middle school. And then the, the, the hippie thing and Cap's personality in that way kind of started when I was thinking, why is he homeschooled? And I thought, well, if he's a hippie who grew up on one of these communes, he's almost a space alien too. Like, he gets to school and he looks at a locker and he can't figure out what it does because he's never owned anything before. So why would you need to lock things away from the people that you're, you're sharing it with? So not only is he this sort of 14-year-old hippie who wears ponchos and love beads and tie-dye, but he is this kind of 13-year-old hermit in a way. Yes? Hey, so as... One of the, so as another person who also wrote their first book when she was 12 uh -huh. and did not have that same fabulous luck, what other advice would you give to aspiring authors? Well, I think the fact that you're here is, is, is saying you're doing exactly the right thing, that you're making books and reading and writing a part of your life. Uh, read a lot, write a lot. Um, I mean, there are a few specific pieces of advice, I would say. Get good at writing dialogue, um, be a good observer, th things like that. But, um, but I would just say, write a lot, um, show people your writing, don't hide it in your closet, where you have a chance to submit to magazines at schools and, and, um, and, and all magazines, always take it, uh, never, you know, this is a little bit more alien to me, but, but post stuff on the internet, right? Um, I'm doing a um, conference with Christopher Paolini of Aragon fame, and, and I believe that his book was discovered because he had it post on, posted on a website, you, you know? So um, write a lot and, and put yourself out there and 
You can't guarantee that good things will happen, but you can guarantee that nothing will happen if you don't put yourself out there. Want to see my book? Sure, sure. <laughs> uh, in a couple of minutes, okay? When you're done? Okay. Yeah. I want to know who you based the, cap the man with the cane from your Okay, who did I base Griffin Bing on, the man with the plan from the Swindle series? Um, I think that in the case of the Swindle books, because it started with the idea of these old movie plots, I think that in the Swindle books, the, the story was king and the characters were sort of created almost to be like a team to execute the plot. So you needed someone like Griffin just because he was the guy who made everything happen. He was the man with the plan. Um, but I didn't actually know a Griffin Bing. I, mean, I got the name from a real kid, but his personality just fit into the story so perfectly. Yes? Oh my gosh, it's so cool. <laughs> anyway, um, I've been reading your books like forever, and it seems like every time I turn around, you have a new one. Like, mm -hmm. I, I read Swindle, and then all of a sudden, there were like two other books, so I kind of gave up on that. But how do you write them so quickly? Like, how, it, how do I write my book so quickly? <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the Vespers have like dispersed this biological agent that I uh, contracted. Um, they want me to stop telling that story, um, but we will not. We, we will not allow them to silence us. Uh, you know, I think a lot of it is um, as your books become more well known, people just come up with ideas for you. You, you know, and and so I'm working on my own books, and at the same time. 39 Clues, which is generated by Scholastic, c comes in, um, and uh, I don't want to miss that boat, right? That's been, I, I sort of thought that th I'd like 39 Clues less a little bit because it's less mine. You know what? The opposite was true. I love being part of a team. When you're a writer, how many times do you have a chance to have coworkers, right? Never. And suddenly, I'm coworkers with the other authors of 39 Clues. And then, you know, Swindle becomes successful, so there's a demand for more Swindle books. Well, um, you don't want to, you know, I mean, it's great that people like your books. So, so you just sort of train yourself to write a little bit more efficiently. Y you know, at any given time, I've got three things going. I'm writing a book now, the last book is going through revision, and I'm planning the next one. So you learn to use your time a little bit better, but mostly you just work harder. Sure. Um, in the first book of the 39 Clues, uh, C. Ned is sort of portrayed, portrayed as a bad kind of person, but in the, um, in the new book, the Medusa plot, she gives Amy and Dan the, the plastic explosive, the, no, no, the smoke bomb, mm -hmm. uh, which is the equivalent of the chocolate and flowers. Um, how did you develop her for the, for the new series? Okay, well, did you read book 10 by Margaret Peterson yeah. Haddix too? I, I think that you started to see at the end of book 10 that a lot of the rivalries inside the Cahill family, branch to branch, were starting to kind of, were, started kind of to, were kind of starting to resolve themselves, uh, which is really what they needed to do in order to, first of all, succeed in the gauntlet and, and unite the family. I mean, in a way, that's what Grace Cahill had always been working towards when she created the contest, was to unite the warring branches of the 39 Clues. And we see in Cahill's versus Vespers that the, um, that the Cahills have to be united in order to fight this common enemy, the Vespers, which in a way Amy and Dan had always known they would have to, to confront sooner or later. Um, if they need to, if the Cahills need to together, then why is Saladin still scratching Ian? Oh, well, you know, um, well, s first of all, Saladin's not necessarily on board. Um, the cat still doesn't like Lucians. Um, and I think that's one of the most fun things about writing Cahills versus Vespers is that even though the Cahills are on the same team now, there's still a lot of old resentments. It's very hard for a Janus or a Madrigal to look at a Lucian and sort of say, okay, we're all buddy-buddy now because we've got a common enemy. Yes, we have to work together, but we're still really, really um, sort of suspicious of each other. 
Uh, very hard to go from mortal enemies to buddies, you know, like that. Thank you. Yes. Um, f first, I'd like to thank you for being here because you really inspire me. Awesome. Thank you. And second of all, when the 39 Clues books were made, I was wondering if you guys came together and made a game plan or if each author was writing, ha-ha, let's see how the next author uh, deals with this. Oh, right. yeah. Yeah. Did we really try to stick it to the next guy? Is that what? <laughs> um, well, before we started, there was a plan. Y you know, it was not a very detailed plan. But for example, when I wrote One False Note, I knew that everything started in Paris because I knew where Rick's book ended. I knew that book three had to be in Japan, so I needed to point them at least in the direction of Asia at the end of One False Note. And I knew that Mozart was going to be the, the Cahill who was the focus of, of One False Note, and the rest was up to me. But uh, we, did have, we did have that direction given to us. I mean, there, there, was, there were certain points where we messed each other up a little bit. Like the way the timing worked out, I was actually writing book eight, The Emperor's Code, at the same time Peter Larangis was writing book seven, The Viper's Nest. So there were a few nasty surprises in his book when my book was already written that I just had to go back and fix. You know, nothing you can do about that. But we didn't necessarily, you know, try to trip each other up. I and mean, we, we do try to help each other when we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do you know who won the 39 Clues contest? Like, it, on the back of the book, it says, like, <coughs> read books. Uh, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it might be on the website, who, who won the original 39 Clues contest. I, I know there was a grand prize winner uh, who was the first person to collect all 39 Clues. Uh, I believe that that was awarded shortly after Margaret's book, B book 10, came out. How about one more? Okay. Yes. Oh, how did I come up with the name Wallace Wallace in No More Dead Dogs? Um, you know, I originally called him um, Rick Falcone, who is the name of one of the minor characters. And then I needed a name for the quarterback. Um, and I thought of Wallace Wallace because uh, my mom actually, as a young woman, worked with a guy named Pierre Pierre. And I always thought it was really funny that he had two of the same name. So I named the quarterback Wallace Wallace. And I went back to writing the book. And it just really annoyed me that the better character had the worst name. You know, so I went back and I switched it so that Wallace would be the main guy with the best name. Thank you. Okay. Well, they're telling me now that I am officially out of time, so I'm sorry we did not have a chance to get to everyone's <laughs> questions. Thank you guys so much for coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.